News of the Times Wicked Wednesdays Victorians and Suicide Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at the Victorian view regarding suicide, its prevalence, its meaning to the Victorian mind, and the root causes. Were they different from today's views? Why would a person take such a drastic action? We will be investigating some of the stories related to suicide and why those people chose to take such an extreme final decision. We stress that this episode is investigative in nature only. If you're feeling vulnerable, please, please do get help from the various sources available. To understand the Victorian mindset on life, death and suicide, we turn to the horrific Ratcliffe murder that we covered in episode 73. As a reminder, John Williams was suspected of the brutal slaying of two families, not very far from one another. He committed suicide in prison, but was tried, and although dead, by trial. His suicide was considered evidence of his guilt. Otherwise, why would he have put his own soul in such jeopardy of everlasting purgatory? On the eve of the new year in 1811, a grim spectacle unfolded in the cobblestone streets of Wapping. Shrouding the neighbourhood in an atmosphere of morbid fascination, John Williams, a man accused of the heinous Ratcliffe Highway murders, had met his tragic end in prison, taking his own life by hanging. Yet fate did not end there, for an unsettling display awaited him in death. Amidst the hushed whispers and gasps of the gathered crowd, a raised platform carried the lifeless form of John Williams through the teeming streets as if some macabre theatre played out before the eyes of an estimated 180,000 onlookers. The weapons allegedly used in his gruesome crimes were arrayed besides his lifeless body, an eerie testimony to the horror that had befallen his unfortunate victims. The procession reached its zenith at the intersection of Commercial Road and Cannon Street, where an ominous pit had been prepared to receive the remains of the notorious murderer. With a calculated air of ritualistic cruelty, his body was unceremoniously cast into the depths of the dark abyss. In a final act of malevolence, a stake was thrust into his heart, following an ancient practice harking back to times when such measures were deemed necessary to contain the malevolent spirit of the departed. Quick lime was then scattered over the deceased, ensuring a rapid decay and obscuring all traces of the morbid scene beneath a cloak of lime and earth. The dimensions of the pit were deliberately chosen, a detail that bears testimony to the depth of vengeance harboured against the malefactor even after death. Such was the fervour of the collective outrage that even as the 19th century dawned, this ghastly episode played out in full. The burial at a crossroad, a site steeped in ominous superstition, adhered to long-standing traditions that considered suicide as a reprehensible act staining the soul of the departed and demanding harsh measures to appease the moral order. In pondering this grim spectacle and its place in history, one cannot help but reflect upon the darker facets of human nature that persisted despite the passage of time. The haunting tale of John Williams serves as a chilling reminder that, even in an age considered modern, the shadows of our past beliefs and customs still cast a formidable pall over the present. The Stigma of Suicide 
In bygone eras, the solemn fate of those who took their own lives bore a peculiar stigma that lingered long after their deaths. Condemned as they were, their remains were denied the sanctified embrace of consecrated ground, instead finding their final resting place at bustling intersections. The rationale behind this gruesome practice rested upon a peculiar belief that sought to thwart malevolent spirits from rising from their graves. The relentless flow of traffic at these busy crossroads, it was thought, would somehow keep any hostile forces suppressed beneath the earth, rendering them harmless. Even in the event that a supernatural entity managed to elude this particular burial pit, it was anticipated to be confounded by the myriad choices offered at the crossroad. The bewildering array of potential paths, it was surmised, would prevent the escape of any otherworldly malevolence that might have taken residence within the departed soul. Yet such precautions did not end there. In an additional measure to secure the deceased against the flight of evil, stakes were driven through their hearts, as if to pin these corrupt spectres firmly to their final abode. The deeply ingrained belief that suicide resulted from demonic enticement and seduction was pervasive throughout early modern Europe, and Britain was no exception to this prevailing notion. Historical shifts in attitudes towards suicide and its legal consequences. Within the annals of English criminal justice, a notable transformation in the approach towards suicide can be discerned as we delve into the year 1811 and the periods preceding prior to approximately 1760. Punitive measures directed at those who took their own lives had significantly waned, with juries showing a marked reluctance to impose penalties. However, it is imperative to note that despite this shift in sentiment, suicide retained its status as a criminal act throughout the entire era under examination. The gravity of legal repercussions for those deemed guilty of self-murder, as determined by coroner's juries, remained severe during this time. The pronouncement of a death by suicide verdict upon an individual distinguishing them from those considered not responsible for their demise due to temporary insanity carried weighty consequences. Until the year 1823, juries held the power to deny a Christian burial to such individuals and enforce rites of desecration upon their remains. Furthermore, the forfeiture of a suicide victim's property within the family was not expunged from the statute books until 1870. The treatment of John Williams' lifeless body following his suicide could be interpreted as a reprimand for both the murders he was purported to have committed and for the audacity to evade the conventional sentence of death by his own hand. This complex interaction of legal ramifications, public sentiment and the desire for justice underscores the intricate dynamics surrounding suicide during this period. With this background, let's take a look at some of the stories of suicide found in the papers and delve into the reasons why. From the Aberdeen Press and Journal, October 1750, a very public suicide. On Friday night at about seven o'clock, a person, well-dressed, was found hanging near Kent Street in Southwark. In his pockets were three shillings and some halfpence, with the following letter directed to his wife. My dear, 
This is to acquaint you that you are the cause of this action. Your behaviour to me has made me distracted. We might have lived happy and in credit had your conduct been like mine. I hope the man who has been the cause of it will think of this sad catastrophe. My child I have left behind, I commend to God's care, and I pray God forgive you, and I am weary of life. I hope he will forgive me. Your husband, John Bracey. We do not know how the gentleman was buried, but the very public nature of the suicide would have placed a permanent stain on his now widowed wife, and possibly even his child. This case from 1800 suggests societal embarrassment for the murder of his wife and then himself whilst in jail for the attempted murder of a gentleman with whom he had formed a special attachment. Alternative lifestyles were strictly prohibited in every sense during Victorian times. The Morning Post, January 1800, Murder and Suicide about eleven o'clock this day, a dreadful circumstance took place in this prison. It may be recollected that some months since a reward of thirty pounds advertised for the apprehension of Mr. Theophilus Smith, a respectable manufacturer in this neighbourhood, for having attempted to murder a Mr. V. Wainwright, a gentleman of Liverpool with whom he was extremely intimate, and who, it is supposedly prompted a fit of jealousy, he, under presence of taking a walk, got into the fields where he suddenly attempted his life. But Mr. Wainwright escaped with some severe wounds, none of which proved mortal, and Mr. Smith absconded, but was some time after apprehended by the Bow Street officers in Market Lane, St. James's, and committed to the county jail in this town for trial under the Black Act, but put his trial off at the last assizes. During his confinement his wife had frequently visited him, and this morning at about eleven o'clock she went to see him, but had not been in his room long before the keeper heard the report of two pistols one immediately after the other, and on going into the room discovered Mr. Smith with his brains blown against the wall and Mrs. S. on the floor with a desperate wound in her back. It appeared a horrid deed had been done by two double barrel pistols which Mr. S. procured by some means and had first shot his wife and then himself. No hopes are entertained of the unhappy lady's recovery. An infant daughter is left to lament the loss of her parents by this rash and dreadful act. In this story from around 1835, as recounted in the broadsides, social ruin again seemed to be the predominant reason to attempt to kill her child and herself. She successfully murders her illegitimate child and is taken to jail and sentenced, where, despite pleas from the judge, she pleads guilty, leaving him no option but to have her executed. From the Broadsides, 1835 The Tragic Story of Fanny Amlet Fanny Amlet, a very accomplished and handsome young woman, was the third daughter of Mr. Richard Amlet, a wealthy glazier residing in Rosedale on the sea coast near Scarborough. At the age of sixteen, she attracted the attention of a dashing lieutenant of the Navy who fell passionately in love with her the first time he beheld her. They had frequent interviews during which he used all his endeavours to persuade her to elope with him and so much had he engaged her affections that in all probability she would have yielded had not her father discovered the design 
and prevented it. On purpose, then, to keep clear of the importunities of her pretended lover, her father sent her off to a relation of his near Sheerness, in hopes that he, the naval officer, never would see her more. But the good man was deceived, for the wily lover made such artful inquiries that in less than a month he discovered where she was. He immediately disguised himself in a shooting dress and set out for the farmhouse. No words could express his delight when he met the object of his love walking on the sea banks. On beholding him, she fainted away. He took her in his arms, kissed her with rapture, and after an hour spent in delightful conversation, they parted with she having engaged to meet him the following evening. Fanny was now so deeply in love with her insidious betrayer that he had little difficulty in persuading her to elope with him. Accordingly, one fine evening in June they met as usual, when, overcome by his flattering tongue and fine promises, she absconded with him in a boat, leaving her clothes behind. They went to Gravesend, where they stopped all night and set off the next day for London, and, passing for a man and wife, took apartments near Fitzroy Square. For the space of four months Fanny lived in the greatest happiness. Her mind was dazzled by the splendid style in which she was kept and the pleasure which surrounded her. But short-lived were her joys. The unsuspecting Fanny perceived not in the smiles and caresses of her deceitful lover the serpent that would sting her to death. Her seducer soon found that his purse could not keep pace with his extravagance. He applied to his friends but was told that they were determined to uphold him in his profession no longer, and that for the future he must confine himself to his pay. The ship to which he belonged was ordered to a distant station, and he took leave of Fanny with much affected tenderness, vowing to return and marry her. Accordingly, he set off and left Fanny almost broken-hearted. For some time she heard from him regularly once a fortnight, and in his last letter she ever received was enclosed a fifty-pound note. After this she heard from him no more. Her situation now may be felt by all those who can sympathise with the sorrows of a ruined female, but it cannot be described. Far advanced in a state of pregnancy, destitute of money, Ashamed to return to her friends, her clothes all sold and pawned, this wretched but lovely young woman was cast destitute upon the world. In the dark of night she left London, and gaining the south road, she wandered till daylight. Ashamed to meet the face of a human being, she got behind a hedge and wept all day. In this pitiful manner she travelled to Yorkshire, walking all night and concealing herself by day, subsisting chiefly on wild berries. Sometimes drenched with rain, she would creep into a shed or a ditch, and in such a situation she was taken in labour. No human assistance was near to help her in the hour of nature's sorrow, and on the cold ground with bitter pains she brought forth a lovely child. She carried her infant in her arms for some miles, till coming to a river where she plunged her baby into the stream. Two countrymen saw her and tried to save the child, but in vain. She was then sent to prison, and when her trial came she pleaded guilty, nor could the judge persuade her from it, and he shed tears while passing sentence of death upon her. 
But what language can repeat the anguish of her distracted parents, her brother and sisters, when they came to the prison to take their last farewell of their lost Fanny? Her aged mother fainted away. She was led to the scaffold in York on Monday last, and suffered amidst thousands of weeping spectators. Shifts in attitudes toward suicide. As the 18th century drew to a close, a noticeable transformation in societal perceptions of suicide emerged, particularly within legal and medical circles. Various social sciences embarked into a quest to redefine and understand suicidal behaviour. From the early pre-Victorian times to the latter part of the 19th century, there seems to be a shift in thinking. Gone are the superstitions of the malignant spirits of suicides possibly coming back to haunt the living. Instead, those who commit suicide are regarded as potentially weak-minded or half-insane. As the field of psychology began to gain momentum, attempts were made to define the reasonings behind suicide and despair within an individual. A contrary view of self-destruction attributed to society and the rapid societal changes rather than being solely attributed to the pathology of an individual. This article from the Newcastle Current asks whether suicides are on the rise in England. Its judgments on people who commit suicide is quite clear with little sympathy of potential tragic reasons behind this dire decision. From the Newcastle Current, the 22nd of June, 1883, Suicide and Suicides Are cases of suicide increasing in number? Every week we record many instances, and besides those there are many which are never recorded at all. For what may not be generally known, High-class newspapers discourage the publication of suicides, just as they avoid giving the details of revolting crimes. The fact is, there is no knowing how much the ghastly particulars which find their way into some of the trashy daily papers impel weak-minded and half-insane people to imitate the acts they read of. Sir Charles Bell, the surgeon of the Middlesex Hospital, on going into a barber's shop to be shaved, told the operator of a case of cutthroat that had just come into the hospital. The man had not succeeded to the extent he desired, said the surgeon, but he might have done so easily if he had known how to set about it. The barber seemed eager to be informed where the cut should have been made, and Sir Charles described the anatomy of the neck and the situation of the great artery. The barber listened and left the room. Not coming back to complete the shaving operation, Sir Charles went to look for him and discovered him in a yard at the rear of the house, with his throat cut. No doubt the eminent surgeon was grateful that the man had tried the experiment upon himself, there is frequently no accounting for acts of suicide. That of Sir John Savage reported this week is a case in point. Successful and honoured, the usual predisposing causes to suicide, it might be thought, were absent. Although Dr. Wimslow mentions that all the members of a particular family evinced suicide tendencies, when they arrived at a certain age. But Irishmen are not addicted to suicide, of course, and there are some cases in which the determination is so strong on the part of the patient to make way with himself that it becomes the business of his life to watch for his opportunity. An instance of this kind was lately reported. A man was watched with some scrupulous attention during nine months, every means so far as his attendants knew were removed from him 
with which he could injure himself, when he was discovered one morning hanging by the neck from his bedstead, quite dead. It subsequently transpired that he must have hoarded every piece of string from the parcels of books that he had been sent to him, and with these which he had concealed, he had twisted a rope with which he had accomplished his purpose. This was what the reporters would call a case of determined suicide. A parallel case is that of a lunatic which we remember. Some years ago, a woman in St Luke's Hospital in London drowned herself in the bathroom of that institution in a most remarkable manner. She managed to secret the key of the bathroom and to make up a dummy to represent herself in the bed in order to deceive the nurse of the ward. In the middle of the night, she stole downstairs and was found next morning lying with her face downwards in the shallow water of the bath. The months of March, June and July record the greatest numbers of suicides, but females appear to prefer September, November and January. Males commit suicide more frequently than females, who, it appears, but rarely cut their throats. There are epidemics of suicide as well as of fever, and it has been noticed that when any notorious example is made known in the newspapers, it is frequently followed by cases of a similar kind. Foggy weather is said to be a sufficient occasion to create a crop of suicides, and November is believed to be the month which is especially favourable for the commission of the crime. In the Pimlico poisoning case of 1886, episode 115, one expounded reason for the reprieve of Adelaide Bartlett was the possibility that her husband had poisoned himself upon learning that Adelaide no longer wished to be intimately involved with her husband and preferred to transfer all her affections to the Reverend George Dyson. Whether he did actually commit suicide or was murdered, we cannot say. But the important aspect is that the jury believed suicide to be a possibility. The reason for this possible suicide would be the despair from her rejection. The Regency views through to Victorian views on suicide show a progression of thought as to why someone would commit suicide and how it was perceived by society. Newspapers are filled with stories of the thousands whose lives of constant poverty made suicide seem an appealing alternative. During the early to mid-18th century, how one was viewed in society, one's reputation within the community could place a strong motivation to look at suicide as an alternative. A person who committed suicide was committing a mortal sin and their spirit was expected to be restless and potentially a future evil spirit that would haunt those living. It was also legally a true hit to one's family, as the legacy of the family would be lost if a suicide was deemed to be purposeful and not due to a fit of insanity. However, in the later 18th century, this view had changed with the burgeoning fields of psychology and the awakening to societal responsibility to one's fellow man. As the current article indicates, many a suicide went unreported, and it is impossible to get any true numbers of the time. Searches in papers give a long list of suicide, many of them indicative of poverty and despair. Beyond poverty and tales of the heart as a reason, one's perception within society was equally a consideration for those contemplating suicide. Has this changed within our now modern 21st century with the advent of social media? That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Victorians and Suicide. We really hope you found this episode interesting 
from a historical perspective. Once again, we ask that if you have found this episode upsetting or challenging, please reach out to friends and family or any number of public support groups who are there to listen. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, suggestions and interaction is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. And a huge thank you to helping us achieve our goal of 1,000 subscribers. We very much appreciate your help in keeping our channel alive. If you haven't subscribed, we would be very grateful if you did. We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe, tell your friends and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. We upload six days a week. Fridays are a new limited series called Forgotten Fridays, where we explore a snapshot from newspaper articles, advertisements and publications of a time from long ago. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times and I am Robin Coles.